This is a small generator that I've built using Lego. And this is it lighting up a low powered LED diode. With the energy crisis we're in, I figured what better time than now to prepare for this blackout apocalypse that's coming. It doesn't output much current, and you won't be selling anything back to the grid, but it does generate a decent amount of voltage for some low powered lights. In this video, I'll show you how you can make your own generators using Lego and some basic materials, and I'll outline some of the basics that you'll need to bear in mind if you want to build one of these. And later in the video, we'll see if we can light up some more LEDs, or perhaps even some higher powered lights. Before we get started, no, this is not another one of those sketchy free energy generators all over YouTube. These small generators require you to actually put in some real work to get an output. And as we all know, LEGO is anything but free. I've chosen to use LEGO to build this thing because personally, I just love LEGO, and it's easy to build almost anything with it. For those LEGO purists out there, I've tried to stick to using LEGO as much as possible, but I apologize for obviously having to use some of these non-LEGO materials here. Now for those of you who don't know, generating electricity is actually really quite simple. It operates on the principle of electromagnetic induction, in which movement between a conductor, like a wire, and a magnetic field will generate an electromotive force. Essentially this means that if you move a conductor through a magnetic field, this will cause electrons to move, which is how electrical current is generated. This is a copper wire, and this is a magnet. Electrons in the atom of the copper wire, when left to their own devices, will move around randomly and jump between other atoms. However, when a wire is exposed to a magnetic field, this field can direct the electrons in a more orderly fashion in the same direction along the length of the wire. This movement of electrons is what generates a potential difference, otherwise known as voltage. And voltage is therefore this pushing force that drives electricity. And current is the amount of the stream of electrons traveling through a conductor per unit time. You can think of these principles like water flowing through a pipe. Voltage is analogous to water pressure. If you have a large pressure behind the water, there will be a strong force on it, which has the potential to move a lot of water. A small amount of water pressure is like low voltage. Current is just like the flow of water. A high current is like a large amount of water passing through a pipe. And a low current is like only a small amount passing through the pipe. You could, for example, have a large voltage pushing a smaller stream of electrons, which could generate a sizable current. Or you might have a smaller voltage pushing a larger amount of electrons, which would also generate a sizable current. So you can see that voltage acts as pressure. But how does the size of the pipe, or wire, affect the current? Well, it acts exactly how you'd think. A small pipe is only able to permit a small amount of water through it, even if there's a great pressure behind it. In this case, the pipe is the limiting factor, and no amount of additional pressure is going to allow more current through it. Wires act exactly the same, which is why selecting the wire size is important when building a generator. In my case, I only wanted enough current to drive some basic lights, so I wasn't really too concerned about generating a huge output. Instead, for convenience sake, I prioritized voltage so that it would be easy to light up a few lights, albeit not very brightly. Something to note here is that the orientation of the wire compared to the magnetic field is important. You can't just wiggle the wires around in a magnetic field and hope to generate much. The main principle to bear in mind if you're going to make one of these is that magnetic fields will generate an electromotive force in a conductor perpendicular to it. Or, in reverse, current flowing through a conductor will generate a magnetic force perpendicular to it. So to take advantage of that, we can orient some wires like this beside a magnet. So just to go over some of these electromagnetic induction principles. The strength of the electromotive force generated will depend on a few different factors. The strength of the magnet, the distance of the magnet from the wire, the number of rotations of the wire coil, the length of the wire, the thickness of the wire, 
and the rate of change of movement between the wire and the magnet. This is summed up via Faraday's law of induction, which says that the absolute value or magnitude of the circulation of the electric field around a closed loop is equal to the rate of change of the magnetic flux through the area enclosed by the loop. Let me try and translate this in a way that makes sense, or at least to me, when making these small generators. Well, let's start with the wire. What wire do we use? How much of it do we use? How much do we coil it? Well, to be quite honest, I've just been experimenting with it by trial and error. There are formulas that can help you determine the optimal thickness and the lengths of the wire to use and the number of turns to use, but these are quite complex and you need to know what output you want. So largely, I've just ignored these in favor of just playing around with different variations and that's really the fun part for me. In general, the more loops of wire you use, the more voltage you can generate. However, this really only works up to a point. After a point, increasing the number of loops becomes quite inefficient as resistance builds. Thicker wires have less resistance and so they can carry a lot more current. However, you can't get as many loops around the spool because the thicker wire just takes up more space. On the other hand, thinner wires can be looped many times around the spool and so they can generate higher voltages for the same area, but they have more resistance and so they can carry less current. Then let's consider the magnets. You don't need to use these fancy expensive neodymium magnets, but it does help if you want to get a really good output. The stronger the magnetic field you can create, then the higher the EMF you can create. I found that if you just want to light up some LEDs, you really don't need particularly strong magnets. Some cheap and small bar magnets work great. Additionally, the closer you can get the wires to the magnets, and the faster you can move the magnets, then the more EMF you can generate. So now lastly, we need movement between the wires and the magnets. You can either move the wire coils, or you can move the magnets. I suppose technically you could move both, uh, but I don't think I've seen this done before. Personally, I think it's easier to keep the wire coil stationary, otherwise you gotta figure out a way to get a brush to connect to touch points on the wire as the wire moves. So for my experiments, I like to spin or move the magnets near the wire coils. The fun point in building these small generators with LEGO is really just testing different variations of the above factors. So what exactly have I used for this generator here? I decided to go with very thin wires that I can easily get it up to a reasonable voltage. Because my plan was really just to light up a few LEDs, I just didn't need that much current. Which is good, because with the length of this thin wire I'm using here, there's likely to be quite a lot of resistance. I used 32 gauge wire here, which is around 0.2 millimeters thick, and it can carry a maximum current of around 0.1 amps, which has a whopping 164 ohms resistance per 1000 feet. Not really sure how many windings I made here, but I used around 75% of a 4 ounce spool of wire with a total length of around 1200 feet. So I'd guess the total length of the wire used here is probably somewhere around 900 feet or 270 meters. For my magnets, I just used some basic neodymium bar magnets from Amazon. They're not particularly strong, and I feel like they have a pretty weak magnetic pull, unless they're quite close to something metal or another magnet. The north-south poles are on opposite sides of the bar, like this. And they came with a sticky sheet that you can use to stick them on things, and I've just used those to stick the magnets onto a LEGO lift arm here. A note of warning here though, this stuff is really sticky and it doesn't seem to come off with soap and water, uh, so you might want to consider other methods of attaching magnets to LEGO if you value your LEGO. The mechanism itself is very simple. Initially I only had one spinning magnet core inside the wire, but I decided to double up and use two so that I could pass a magnetic field on both sides of the wire, forcing more electrons to flow. This effectively boosts the output quite a bit. The magnets are situated north-south, north-south on each lift arm core, so that the two cores are attracting each other. 
This ensures that one side of the wires is receiving a north, and then the opposite side is exposed to a south pole. Because the wire is changing direction as it wraps around the Lego, both sides are pushing electrons in the same direction around the loop, which boosts voltage production. The Lego mechanism is also very simple. It's a 36 tooth gear driving two 12 tooth gears in opposite directions to each other. And then a simple gearbox with two series of 36 to 12 tooth gears. So the total input to output ratio is one rotation to 27 rotations. It really doesn't need to spin this fast, but I find it quite satisfying. So to recap, more wire loops means more voltage. Thicker wires means more current carrying capacity. Stronger magnets means more voltage and current. Faster movement between the magnet and the wire means more voltage and current. And less space between the magnet and wire means more voltage and current. Okay, so let's run a few tests to find out exactly what we can power with this little generator. And we'll start with just a singular standard LED. We've already seen this LED, it was in the introduction to this video, and this is a green LED which lights up at around yeah, 2.5 to 2.7 volts. As you can see here, this one lights up very easily. Now let's try a white high powered LED which typically requires around 3 volts to light up. While this one does light up, it's nowhere near as bright as when it's hooked up to a battery. And that's mainly because the current being supplied by this generator really just isn't enough. Okay, so all of these light up, demonstrating that the voltage output of this generator is decent enough. But can it produce enough current to light up a few more of these LEDs in parallel? I'm using this breadboard to add them easily. So the power goes into the board here, and we can line up some of those green dudes along here. Okay, so that seems to work. How about adding some more LEDs? Let me add some red ones. Then let's get the polarity right. And now let's add a few more. Yep, so it seems we can easily light up around 18 LEDs. There's also a fun little experiment I wanted to try out. This one is not very practical, but I just wanted to build something that could pick up some magnetic fields from quite a distance. And so I wrapped an entire 100 gram roll of 38 gauge wire, which is very very thin, around a large iron bolt. At a guess, I'd say there are a few thousand feet of wire on this thing. This thing is quite sensitive to magnetic fields from a distance, and can generate quite a large voltage when up close. Though as you can imagine, there is a huge resistance due to the thin wire and the ridiculous length of it. Here you can see I've placed the bolt near the spinning magnets, but there's still quite a significant distance between them. And it seems to light up quite brightly. As I move the magnets away from the bolt, the LED is still lit, but it begins to dim. In some other tests I've done, I've actually managed to light this thing up from over a foot away using stronger magnets. This LED array here lights up at around 6 volts, and typically likes to consume around 7 to 8 volts. As you can see here, some of the spikes we're generating seem to be going probably above 6 volts. Again, it's not particularly bright due to the low current, but some of these spikes do seem to be going probably above 6 volts. Next, I thought it would be interesting to try out a few bulbs that I know require higher voltages to light. This first one here is a 1.5 watt 12 volt LED bulb that has what looks to be about 36 tiny LEDs in it. And I found that this thing lights up at around 8 volts. Interestingly, it seems this generator here is outputting some occasional AC spikes up to around 8 or more volts. These flashes are only quite brief, and they're not particularly bright, but again, it does seem to be producing some flashes here. And lastly, I decided to up the ante and try an LED that is rated for a whopping 20 watts, and requires somewhere between 10 and 36 volts to light up. I was quite surprised to see this does actually produce some brief flashes. But as I expected, with such a low current, these flashes are brief and quite weak. 
And finally, let's see exactly how much voltage is being generated here. Right now, the output from the generator is an AC, or alternating current. This is because for each turn of the magnets, the wire is oscillating between exposure to north and south poles. So to measure the output using a DC multimeter, I first need to convert the signal to DC, or direct current. To do this, I'm going to use what's called a full bridge rectifier, which converts AC to DC. You can actually make one of these using four diodes to direct the flow of current along only one direction. Uh, but I'm being lazy, so I'm just going to use one of these rectifiers from Amazon. I won't go into detail about how a rectifier works, but I might do that in a future video if it's needed. For now, just know that it takes AC current and converts it to DC, though with a little bit of loss of efficiency. So as you can see from the readout here in the multimeter, there actually does seem to be significant loss. Some of the peaks are being chopped off here. And it looks like it's generating somewhere between 2 and 3 volts. There seem to be some occasional spikes that go above 3 volts, but for the most part it seems to be comfortably holding between 2 and 3 volts. Right, so we've seen that using some pretty basic materials, we can quite easily produce enough voltage with one of these small LEGO generators to light up some LEDs. If you'd like to see more of these LEGO generators, I'll be creating videos on some of the other generators I've been building, including some of the more powerful ones. In these, I'll also show you how you can make your own generators more useful by turning AC power into DC, and storing some of the energy in capacitors so that you can use them for doing something actually useful. Feel free to subscribe if you'd like to see more, and I'll see you in the next one.